So we'll do some housekeeping information real quick. Uh, we are being recorded. Um, I will be taking attendance as well as there's a link in the chat. If you will click on that and fill out the information to claim CEU credits. And we'll go ahead and get started with Christy Duke. Thank you. Um, please don't take offense. We're going to go ahead and mute people, um, uh, everybody. Um, but with that said, please feel free to interrupt me at any time and ask questions or to type it in the chat. And I'm more than happy to answer that. Um, I see a lot of new names on here. So just some brief introductions. My name is Christy Duke, and I am an epidemiologist with United South and Eastern Tribes. I am the Tribal Epidemiology Center uh, uh, program manager. Um, we usually start out these sessions. I just do a very brief overview of the data um, uh, in our region that's affecting um, our tribal communities, um, and I just do a weekly update on that. And then um, are we having Dr. Mira first, Brian or Alita? Alita is first. Okay. All right. Then I'll turn it over to Alita and then um, Dr. Mira will follow up. I'm trying to advance my slides. There we go. Um, so um, for those of you who don't know, most of the tribal nations um, within our area are reporting their numbers to the IHS uh, Nashville area office. And we collaborate very closely with IHS and um, we're able to produce the weekly report that we send out. This is the aggregate numbers. You can see in the past week, we have gone from 22,246 uh, tests being conducted to 23. 3,287. The number of positives has slowed down somewhat. They were increasing by uh, about 100 a week or so, um, but it does look like it's slowed down a little bit. And we have uh, 1,881 positives as compared to this time last week, which was 1,847. Um, if you divide that by the total number tested, that is about an 8% positivity rate. Um, and as you can see, our number negative increased correspondingly as well. So thanks to all of the sites that are reporting to the IHS Nashville area office, and there are 26 sites that are reporting in. So we do have good representation in our region um, for uh, testing numbers. So thank you if you are one of the sites reporting. That is greatly appreciated both by IHS and USET because we are tracking these numbers. So this graph, which I'll explain, um, I know many of you have seen this, but many of you probably have not. Um, because of all of the limitations around RPMS, which I'm sure we are all aware of um, if we are working in it, um, you know, we're really struggling um, with capturing, uh, COVID data is going in there, but there are some communities that are doing community testing and it may not be captured in the electronic health record. Um, so we decided to look at what was going on um, around the tribal nations. So we pulled the data um, for all of the purchased and referred care delivery areas um, within the 13 states um, in which the tribal nations are located. So that's the red bar. Those are all the PERCA areas for all of the, the, um, the tribal nations um, uh, within our area. So you can see this time last week, we were at 239 per 10,000 cases, um, and that is increased to 241 per 10,000. You compare that to the 13 U the states, um, the USET states, that's 206,000, uh, 206 per 10,000 this time last week, and that's um, increased to 215,000, uh, 215 per 10,000, my apologies. And um, we compare that to all of the U.S. at 167 per 10,000 this time last week compared to 176 uh, per 10,000. So it's, it's the same trend that we've been seeing before. Uh, the PERCTA counties are consistently higher. And this is all races. This is not just AIAN uh, folks. We are looking at all races within the PERCTA counties. Uh, many states are not breaking down their county level data um, by race ethnicity. So we were unable to drill down to that level. 
but what's going on in the county we know is going to be this um, similar to what's going on in the tribal uh, communities. So we are seeing consistently higher levels than um, the states um, and the United States, and that seems to be tracking from week to week. We are seeing those increases. Just one as a reminder, um, the USET Tribal Epidemiology Center, if you are interested in doing your own contact tracing and you have not done so, we have set up a tool and a program called REDCAP to allow your tribal nation to do that work. Um, if you would like assistance getting that set up, you can contact us at usetepi at usetinc.org and we will be happy to help you get a uh, get that set up within your systems um, and to provide you any support that you may need if you are interested in conducting contact tracing, case follow-up, um, any of that sort of work. Um, in addition, we are providing these weekly reports. Let me go back one. Um, and so each of these, this graph that you see is again the aggregate level, but we also produce a weekly report that has tribal specific data. Um, so you'd see a graph just like that that would look at your tribe's purchased and referred care delivery area uh, compared to your state and compared with the U.S. Those are going out to tribal leaders and health directors. So if you're not getting those, please reach out to um, your leadership and ask if you can get a copy of that so you can track from week to week what's going on. Um, we also include your specific testing numbers um, in, in that information if, if you're one of the reporting sites. Um, we can tailor those reports or provide special request information should you need it. So again, if you would like any of that uh, work conducted, please contact us at usetepi at usetinc.org. Now I'm going to turn it uh, back over to Brian for a brief introduction. Um, and then we'll, I'm really excited to hear the next presentation um, about pediatrics and the effect of COVID-19 on PEDS. So um, I'll turn that over to Brian. Are there any questions for me before? I don't see any. I'm going to stop sharing because I can't see faces when I share. If you have any questions, you can type them into the chat and we'll get to them. Uh, hearing none, we'll move on to Alita Carter. Should I share my screen? Yes. Okay. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, awesome. Right, so hello everyone. My name is Alina Jury Carter. I am the CEO and founder of the Commission for Health. We are a health consulting business. We provide health education and training services um, with the intention of empowering people to become the change that they want to see in their communities and within their lives. So this presentation is going to be on pediatrics and COVID-19. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> I do have to disclaim um, the content that I am presenting today does not represent the views of my clients or employers. I am not here in representation of any local, state, or federal government entities. So the objectives um, that I have for today is that at the end of this presentation, the attendees will be able to identify the current reported transmission, mortality, and hospitalization rates for children concerning SARS-CoV-2, also known as COVID-19. Understand current information and data that is available concerning children in COVID-19, and to be able to summarize the current recommendations from the NIH, the American Academy of Pediatrics, Centers for Disease, um, and um, I'm sorry, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, as well as oh, it jumped. Okay, there you go. As well as um, recommendations for children wearing masks and returning to school. Okay, there we are. So the incubation period, just some background information, the incubation period um, ranges from two days to two weeks. The average is six days, and the data that's currently available does not distinguish the incubation period to be different for children than it is in adults. The period of being contagious from mild to moderate illness 
has been said to be 10 days or less. And for immunocompromised, immunosuppressed, severe or critically ill old patients with COVID-19, that period of being contagious can be anywhere from um, zero to 20 days. The general thought at this point is that the majority of transmission happens through droplet transmission. However, airborne transmission is possible in poorly ventilated areas that are densely populated. Um, or when a patient has COVID-19 and is given a respiratory treatment. Um, and so this isn't something that's unique to COVID-19. This is something that also happens with um, influenza. I was actually an infection prevention and control nurse before I went into public health. Um, and we actually saw that as well with um, influenza. So anytime you give a respiratory treatment and someone has a respiratory viral illness, um, we typically suggest that um, use something called respiratory precautions, which means that there's six feet distance kept between um, them and another patient. So the CDC's data for Alaskan Natives and American Indians reported that new diagnosis of COVID-19 is 3.5 times higher for American Indians and Alaskan Natives when compared to their white counterparts. Also, children 18 and under have the highest infection rate which is somewhat um, different than, of course, the general population. When it comes to the infection rates and risk, uh, there was a report in May that said that Native Americans had the highest per capita rate of infection in the United States in April. As of April 30th, they actually were not the highest. They were the third highest after New York City and New Jersey, but in May, um, unfortunately, they did become the highest per capita rate of infection. The higher risk of severe illness due to having comorbidities of diabetes, um, hypertension, and other chronic, chronic conditions also exist when compared to the general populations. However, I will mention that minorities in general have been at higher risk for severe illness um, due to having comorbidities, so that that risk of, of higher severity of illness does not just apply to um, the American Indian and Alaska Native population. So according to the Navajo Nation's transmission reports, the spread of COVID-19 was attributed to several factors, but I'll mention a few. One of the factors that they mentioned was that many of the families live in multi-generational homes. Um, there was a, a lack of running water in some of the communities, and there was a, a limited number of grocery stores, gas stations, and food supplies. So when we actually talk about transmission in children, we are seeing a different dynamic than what we see in adults. So I'm gonna talk about a few case studies that were published. And so there was a large study from South Korea where effective, contrast, effective contact tracing efforts were being reported. And that case study informed us that children less than two years of age transmitted less than adults do. Children between the ages of 10 to 19 were reported to be equally infectious as adults. And the more recent data within the USA reports that children may be responsible for as much as 10% of new cases that occur in children. In France, there was a nine-year-old boy with COVID-19 and uh, this child also had two other viral illnesses. He happened to come into contact with 80 children that attended a total of three schools. Um, and there wasn't any proven secondary transmission of the COVID-19 virus. There was a separate case study where there was a nine-year-old boy in Australia and uh, nine staff members. So the nine-year-old boy and nine staff members were all positive for a total of 10 positive patients. Um, and they had contact with a total of 735 students. Pardon me, I don't know why my slides keep jumping. Um, and 128 staff that attended a total of 15 schools, um, and only two infections were traced back to the original 10 patients that were positive. 
Um, now, I do, again, want to point to the fact that some of these other countries have more stringent requirements for wearing a face mask um, and for some of them instituted stay-at-home orders before we did. Um, and some of them as countries as a whole instituted stay-at-home orders as opposed to certain provinces, um, you know, doing that as single um, entities. So again, the transmission continued. For our household contact studies from multiple countries, it has shown that children more frequently became infected after being exposed to an uh, infected adult as opposed to transmitting to adults. So I know that was a hot button topic here in the United States as we were contemplating if the return to school was going to be recommended or not. Uh, but again, I do want to stress that the children were at home and they weren't being exposed to the general public as much as other adults were. So some of the data that we have right now is pretty limited. I did, what, I did have an update with breaking news as far as last week or maybe two weeks ago, it's two weeks ago now, um, there was an outbreak with the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill after they had been in class for one week. There were 177 students that tested positive for coronavirus and there were 365 students that were placed on quarantine. And so um, the update as of this week was that they allowed the students to cancel their room and board contracts and then they changed their platform to be strictly online for the fall. So for the review of symptoms, they are um, pretty vague in my opinion. Fever, fatigue, headache, myalgia is also known as muscle aches, cough, nasal congestion, or rhinorrhea, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea or vomiting, poor appetite or poor feeding. And um, I'm going to go back to that slide. So um, the reason why I say that these signs and symptoms are pretty vague is because if you've ever worked in pediatrics, you know these are like the signs and symptoms for everything. <laughs> um, strep pharyngitis, viral pharyngitis, allergic rhinitis. So um, it can be pretty difficult to distinguish COVID-19 from some of the other common childhood illnesses that we would typically evaluate children from. So oh, it's to make sure that you truly interview the children and their families when they come in to try to evaluate their risk of being exposed to COVID-19. So multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, also known as MIS-C, is a vasculitis that kind of resembles Kawasaki's disease in this presentation. Um, and so I thought that this was a great algorithm. Um, it's been termed as a diagnostic pathway by the American College of Rheumatology, and the link to it is going to be included in my references. But it's a great algorithm in terms of um, when, you're, when you should kind of start to raise some of those red flags in terms of does this child really need to be evaluated for Missy, or is this something else that I, I need to be looking uh, further into. Um, what I will say is that um, the onset of MIS-C does not always happen simultaneously with the onset of symptoms of COVID-19. Some of these cases have been reported to start two to four weeks after the onset of COVID-19 um, signs and symptoms. Um, and some of the children actually did not have signs and symptoms of COVID-19, they actually presented to an emergency room or to their primary care provider with the Kawasaki disease presentation, and they were uh, tested for antibodies for COVID-19, and the antibody test came back positive. So that's just something to keep in the forefront of your mind. So the signs and symptoms for MIS-C would be Kawasaki disease-like symptoms, that have been reported at times with gastrointestinal signs and symptoms and or neurologic signs and symptoms, toxic shock syndrome, like features with hemodynamic instability. So um, you do not want to monitor these children at home. Um, if they present to you with this type of presentation, you want to make sure that they are being monitored within a medical facility. 
um, cytokine storm, macrophage activation, or hyperinflammatory features, abnormal clotting, poor heart function, diarrhea, gastrointestinal sy symptoms, acute kidney injury, shortness of breath, um, suggestive of congestive heart failure, respiratory symptoms may or may not be present in pediatric patients. So, um, you know, one of the things that we kind of joked about when I, I worked in the ER is if it, we say, if it, if it acts like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a zebra. So um, just to kind of, you know, really uh, keep you asking yourself questions, what could this be? What, initial, what additional diagnostic tests do we really need to be looking into? This is a really neat table that was provided um, by the CDC. Um, and it really just highlights the values. These are three different cohorts of children. So there's class one, class two, class three, and it tells you what the median lab value was or were for you know, their inflammatory markers, for their clotting um, um, markers. So I just thought that this was really interesting and you can, I will make sure that you all have access to the slide so that you can go back to look at what these values were on average. What is the risk and what are the trends telling us? So between Ju July 9th of 2020 and August the 6th of 2020, there has been a 90% increase in positive cases in children. Nearly 10% of COVID-19 positive tests were from children as of August the 6th, 2020, when you look back from the initial uh, surge, or when we started to track the surge in the United States, which was about the middle of February to the beginning of March. This data was collected from 49 states, Puerto Rico, Guam, Washington, DC, and New York City. And so um, uh, some other things to really keep in uh, the forefront of your mind is that uh, again, this data was um, collected when we started to see a resurgence um, of the spiking in different states in the United States. And also we started to see a lot of the uh, stay-at-home orders in, in terms of when we started to see the children's transmission rates increase. For hospitalization rates, um, children that were less than two years of age stood the highest risk for hospitalization and approximately one third of children that are hospitalized from COVID-19 are admitted to an ICU. The risk of hospitalization for children with COVID-19 overall is lower than it is in adults. Nearly half of the hospitalized children had comorbid comorbidities. So there were uh, other chronic illnesses that were in existence at the same time. And the most commonly reported chronic disease processes were obesity, chronic lung disease, and prematurity at the time of birth. The mortality rates from the CDC ranged anywhere from 0 to 0.4% 0 in children within the USA. And as of two weeks ago, there had been 90 deaths in the children within the USA. Um, and just to give you a baseline for comparison, uh, annually about 100 children die from influenza. This was a great graphic that was provided by the American Academy of Pediatrics and it shows the states and which states, the darker states have been more significantly impacted than the lighter states. And I just thought that it was a great way to um, be able to see what areas had the higher transmission rates or the higher burden for COVID-19. This here is a picture of the Texas Memorial Stadium, which is home to the Longhorns. Um, and it has a seating capacity of about 100,000 to help to provide you with a, visu a visual. So about eight in 100,000 children are hospitalized from COVID-19 and one third of that eight children would then potentially go on to be admitted to an ICU. And this is just to help you to kind of wrap your mind around the numbers. Sometimes numbers can become numbing. So I thought that this was a great visual to just understand the risk of hospitalization and ICU admission when it came to 
the um, infection rates of COVID-19 within the, within the United States. Recommendations from the AAP and CDC were that children two years of age and older should wear a fabric mask if safe to do so. For most children, it is safe, but if you want to really just make sure you've done your due diligence, I will always have them have that conversation with their pediatrician. Children should return to school when it is safe within the region to do so. Um, and I'm stressing uh, when it is safe within the region to do so because we are not doing blanket statements um, nationally here within the United States as to when children should or should not return to school. Um, the individual states and sometimes on a county by county um, situation are determining what is best for them and their children, um, you know, as, as individual entities. But we do want to teach them about hand hygiene and we do want to encourage them to practice. So singing a happy birthday song twice, singing the ABC song, um, any type of, um, you know, fun activity or fun song that you can teach them that covers that 20 seconds of scrubbing um, is really important. And so just some updates to the research concerning pediatrics specifically, is that T-cell immunity is really being looked into. While T-cell immunity is being looked into overall, and even in adult population, I read a, an article yesterday that said that women seem to have a better T-cell response than men do, um, and that may be linked to why men experience a higher severity of the illness than women do, but this also is uh, there is a, a, a significant level of suspicion concerning uh, T-cell immunity in children. Um, and so there's actually, and there's also um, a great index of um, research that is being done when it concerns the ACE2 receptors in children and how those are related to the severity of illness or the lack thereof. You know, are children getting less sick than adults because they have less ACE2 receptors, which have been reported to be the entry site for the COVID-19? So there's actually a study by NIH that's being done currently called the HERO study um, that was supposed to enroll 6,000 children and their families to be able to swab them and really understand the role that ACE2 receptors are playing with the um, expression of COVID-19 in pediatric patients, and it's supposed to close out um, at the earliest and sometime in December. These are some resources that I was able to locate concerning um, Alaska Natives and American Indians. The CDC um, has a toolkit. Um, it's called the CDC Tribal Communities Plan, Prepare, and Respond Tool. I've included the link. The CDC also has um, public Health grand rounds and I know we are all um, terribly busy for the most part. I encourage everyone to attend these grand rounds just because um, they are really current and they help to keep um, your eyes open to all public health issues, um, not just COVID-19. They actually had a presentation on acute flaccid myelitis. Um, in July, and then in August, the media broke the news that there was supposed to be this huge outbreak of a paralytic virus. Um, and as a lot of misinformation was being given, but if you attended the public health grand rounds in July, you had the information to be able to have an informed discussion with your patients and your colleagues. There's also the Indian Health Service, which Christine mentioned um, beforehand. And then I also found um, an organization by the name of the Urban Indian Health Institute. They had a great fact sheet for providers, employers, and the general public concerning um, COVID-19. And I felt that they had some culturally sensitive content that was there. Um, and so I, I like the fact sheets that they had available. Um, that is the end of my content, and then I probably have about 10 slides worth of references, so I'm not going to uh, torture you by um, reading to you each of my references. Uh, as I did state in the beginning, I will give you uh, um, access or make sure that someone has the PDF version um, of my slides, um, and then I'm just going to highlight my contact information. 
Uh, if you would like to look into the education or the other services that my company offers, you can go to the website, www.commissionforhealth.com. My email address is tc, the number four, the word health at gmail.com. And then my business phone is 240-630-1989. And then if you all have any questions, I suppose I may have a few minutes um, to answer some, but just kind of with the disclaimer that the data is changing. <laughs> and so I don't think anybody should speak from a definite standpoint, um, just because schools are reopening and as I told Christy and Brian uh, preliminarily coming into this presentation, the data is probably going to look completely different in two to three months than it does right now. So um, I am going to turn the facilitation of this um, webinar back over. I actually have just a quick question. Um, you had said that the rate of hospitalization for those less than two is was the highest. Yes. Um, is that amongst peds or amongst all people? No, 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 just amongst pediatrics. My presentation only referred to pediatrics. Okay, just just clarifying. Thank you. That was. Uh, I believe that. Uh, I, well, so and then, and then again, the regional differences are still different. When children under two for all populations okay. are the highest risk for hospitalization. Um, but region by region, that you know that that age range changes within the state of Maryland, which is where I reside. The age range has been somewhere to thirty to fifty for the highest hospitalization. So it really just depends on what region you're um, you're residing in. But specific to the pediatric population, children under the age of two were the highest risk for hospitalization. Okay, and then I had one last question, and it is out of left field, so if you don't know the answer, I apologize. Dr. Mira, I've been meaning to ask you this, too, so if anybody knows, chime in. Um, does anybody know what the effects, potential effects um, on COVID, on epilepsy um, would be, or has they, have they seen any indication or any speculation um, about being higher risk or um, more greatly uh, affected by COVID, either short term or long term? I cannot say that I have heard specifically of epilepsy. I've heard that some of the children present with symptoms of meningitis, um, but I haven't heard that specifically a mention of, of a high frequency of epilepsy concerning COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Mira, if you want to uh, address it, you can feel free to jump in. You're on mute. You are muting him, Brian? I'm sorry. Brian's muting me. <laughs> uh, wonderful presentation. Um, no, I have not read a specific topic of epilepsy and COVID, but there are in adults, uh, which I focus the literature more on, more on, there are neurological manifestations. Uh, the majority are strokes, uh, but of course, you know anything can come with a seizure. If you have a, you have a, if you have epilepsy and you have a low th seizure threshold, any febrile illness can precipitate it. But a connection of COVID leading to epilepsy, I have not read anything. And not even so much that, but just the reverse about potential complications um, that somebody with epilepsy might face if they well, got. I, think, I, I mean, this is just uh, not not from any literature. You know, any sure. uh, febrile or acute stress situation on someone with epilepsy can trigger, you know, can decrease the threshold for a seizure. Okay. And in adults, there are like um, the speaker presented, there are cases of uh, meningitis. And actually there is a, an autopsy study of a few patients in which encephalitis was reported by COVID-19. Oh, interesting. Rare. Uh, I mean, we haven't seen any here. Uh, we've had a couple thousand of COVID patients already. Um, but I guess, the, I mean, I, this is so new that I wouldn't be surprised that we find reports in the future making more detailed descriptions. Okay, thank you. And with that said, if, are there any more questions? I, I closed the chat. Are there any more questions in the chat? If not, we can turn it over to Dr. Mira. I have one question. On, on the studies that you presented of children in school being infected and then the outcomes, 
those were in other countries. Maybe I missed it, but in the in the U.S., is it like a because sometimes you hear a report that there's an outbreak and then the other one that nothing's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, what what is your overall opinion on school opening and the risk for these you know outbreaks? So I actually read an article that was in the New York Times, and again, you know, this data is coming in lightning fast, but I read an article from the New York Times, I want to say it was published yesterday or maybe two days ago, where Germany, um, they reopened their schools two months before we did, um, and they have done um, pretty well with their school reopenings. There hasn't been huge outbreaks, there have been individual cases, but you know, I believe Germany was one of those nations where everyone was locked down at the same time, everyone was forced to wear a mask, and they are really taking the hand washing um, suggestions well. Um, unfortunately, here within the United States, we don't have a national mandate to wear masks. Social distancing, um, even within my state, I, I mean, I can go to um, my county is pretty strict, but if I go to a neighboring county, which I have done in the recent past, um, I went to the harbor and no one was wearing a mask. Um, I have two children who are both um, high risk. They both have asthma and we didn't, we didn't depart our vehicle because no one had on a mask. We were literally the only family that I saw within eyesight that had a mask within arm's reach. Thank you. Okay, um, should I go on? Yes, yes, sir. I, I, I need to be allowed to share. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Can you see my presentation there? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so I want to cover several subjects today. Um, and the first one's going to be proning. And this uh, I chose because, you know, high complexity hospitals with big ICUs have had experience with proning before on uh, patients with ARDS. And proning is just flipping the patient upside down to improve lung ox uh, blood oxygenation, which sounds very simple in concept, but it's pretty, uh, I wouldn't say complicated, but it takes a team effort to, to implement this. And in smaller rural hospitals with, with smaller ICUs, this is not a very common uh, strategy because usually the small ICUs, when they have a patient that requires several days of uh, mechanical ventilation, those patients are usually transferred to higher levels of care uh, and units in which ARDS uh, is managed uh, uh, better because they have more experience and they may have ECMO and other things that small hospitals don't have. But now with the COVID pandemic, we are seeing that sometimes we don't have a bed to transfer a patient out and we have to keep these patients. So we were, you know, reviewing this with our hospitalists and trying to get this uh, uh, implement this strategy in place. And um, the concept is that uh, the persons who have ARDS um, and have a PF ratio of less than 150, and PF ratio is the the um, division of the pulmonary artery. I'm sorry the uh, ar arterial oxygen partial pressure divided by the fraction of oxygen that you are breathing. And for example, a normal person breathes a fraction of 21%. So if I would sample a norm normal person or a healthy person, I'm sorry, not normal, healthy person's arterial blood, uh, I would expect to get around 95 millimeters of mercury of partial oxygen pressure. You divide that by the inspired oxygen fraction, which is 21%, uh, and you'll get a number which is around the four or five hundreds. A uh, person with ARDS, that is, to give you an example, on a ventilator, and you are uh, giving them 60% oxygen, uh, they may have a PO2 around 60, and that gives you a PF ratio of 150. So this is the simple formula to see who may be 
in need of uh, another strategy beyond the one you're using. So it as I mentioned, it requires a team approach. It requires planning and attention. And there's basically two methods. You have a team uh, that just goes and flips the patient on the bed, or you have special beds that do the proning for you. So what is the physiology of prone position in ARDS? So this is a uh, illustration in which you see a person lying down supine, like most patients are in the hospital beds. And the top parts of the lung, the lighter purple, get good ventilation, but the dorsal parts, the, the alveoli tend to collapse because of the pressure basically on the gradient and the way the, the anatomies of the lungs are. And you can see here that the alveoli on the low on the dorsal part of the lung are collapsed. And also the major blood flow uh, goes to this bottom part of the lung just because of a gravity issue. So if you have an alveoli that has poor ventilation and great perfusion, you, ha you have a great mismatch of that ventilation perfusion ratio and that's when you get very hypoxemic. So if you flip the patient into a prone position, then what you'll have is that the bottom parts of the lungs now, you can see the, 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 the parts that are collapsed are much smaller, just based on the anatomy of the lung, that wedge-shaped anatomy that it has, that, is, that gets improved. Also, you don't have the heart compressing on the lungs like you have in this position just by the gravity. Oops, sorry. The lungs are, uh, the, the lungs are in the bottom and the top here and in the bottom here. So what you achieve is that this alveoli that was collapsed now uh, can expand better and um, the perfusion decreases on, on, the, on that type of part of the lung that was collapsed before. So the, the ventilation perfusion ratio improves and you can oxygenate the blood much better. So does this, okay, very nice. I got a good, you know, plausible explanation of why this works, but does it really work? So there are two trials. One's called the Perceva trial in 2013. This was before COVID. And they randomized patients to proning or not. They looked at 28-day mortality and um, the survival rate improved by 50%. Mortality was like 32% on the non-prone group and 16% on the group that was prone and the complications were similar. And then the Afronet trial actually looked at patients with ARDS to see how many of them were being prone. And only 32% in major ICUs used a strategy. And in those patients in which it was used, there was a significant increase in oxygenation and significant increase in the driving pressures uh, to breathe. So this, we know it works for ARDS and uh, COVID as time goes by, the ARDS is more similar to the previous pre-COVID ARDS than, we, than it was initially stipulated. So there are some differences on the lung pathology, but the physiology of the lungs seems to be pretty similar, not exactly, but pretty similar. So uh, this is a strategy that you, we should be using. And the innovation is that in the past, we would use this only for pa uh, uh, patients who were on a ventilator. But now there's been multiple reports in which a patient, before they go into a vent, I mean, they're getting hypoxic, they're using high flow oxygen, um, and then you can flip the patient upside down and they uh, improve their oxygenation. And you can even, you may be able to avoid um, intubating the patient and putting them on mechanical ventilation. Now this patient was proned uh, by a team. So they basically very carefully flipped them over and the complications that you have to be aware of is making sure the patient doesn't get extubated during that procedure, that the, vent, the arterial lines or venous lines do not, are not pulled off, and that you pay a lot of attention to the, the cubit eye ulcers that may form in different places than where you, we are used to see. Because when a patient is supine, you usually get the ulcers in the heels, you'll get them in the buttocks, you'll get them in the scapular area, here it's the opposite, the pressures in a different part of your body and also on your face. So you have to be pay attention to all those details. Now there are uh, beds that can automatically prone you. Uh, they are, we don't have one in our hospital. They're extremely expensive. 
and um, but they seem, from what I've read, to facilitate the the not having to have a proning team. And um, the other day I was in a webinar from John Hopkins, and they have a proning team in John Hopkins, which is a group of nurses and other health professionals that when someone needs proning, they already have practiced it, and they make sure that complications are minimized. Um, and I was telling one of my colleagues when I saw this bed that if I ever need to be prone, please make sure I'm completely in a coma because it seems to be like you're locked and can't move anywhere uh, in this machine. Okay, switching gears. So there was advice, a recent ad advice on August 21st from the WHO on mask use for children. Now I have to say this, this uh, advice was based on expert recommendation, not based on any trials. And it's very difficult to have trials in this situation right now, but I, hopefully we will have some more uh, objective data. And what they recommended was that children under the age of five uh, should not be uh, wearing masks as a preventive measure against COVID-19. Uh, and the rationale is because this can interfere with childhood developmental milestones. There, there are challenges at, at children this age with mask compliance and the, also the autonomy that is required to wear a mask properly uh, at that age is probably not there. Uh, so if countries are uh, uh, making it obligatory to use masks on two or three years old, they recommend that that should be supervised by adults at all times. For children six to 11 years old, they're not, they're saying you shouldn't make a blanket recommendation that everybody should wear a mask, but you should consider what is the epidemiology of your site. I mean, what is your local transmission rates? Are you in the peak or you're uh, you know, a very low part of the epidemic or the pandemic? Uh, what is the child individual's child ability to comply with that uh, mask wear? Um, and whether these children, when they go home, are they in contact with high-risk adults or not? And other factors to be involved. So here, it's more like on a case-by-case -case basis, which Every time you implement a case-by-case -case basis, that makes it more complicated, I agree. But this is, the, I'm just giving you the recommendations that they came up with. For children 12 years or older, everybody should be wearing a mask, uh, like adults, but there's two uh, waivers or caveats. Make mask sh use should not be required for any child who has developmental disorders, disabilities, or other health conditions that could interfere with wearing a mask. And also they make a point, and this is so true because we've seen it in our, in our area, that face shields only provide eye protection and should not be considered as the equivalent of mask with respect to droplet protection and source control because many schools in, in our area, we have seen the teachers just wearing the face shield. Now there are some transparent masks out there uh, because sometimes it's important for uh, children to be able to uh, read your lips and uh, for learning especially if they have some you know, uh, uh, auditory problems. But in general, uh, you should tell them that the face shield is an addition. It's not a substitution for the mask. Switching gears, uh, this article was published on Annals of Internal Medicine and it looked at over 80,000 of individuals in the United States admitted uh, with them in the hospital for influenza from the year 2000, season 2010-11 through season 2017-18. And what they were looking is for cardiovascular complications. And they found that 11.7% of these individuals had a cardiovascular event, either heart failure or an ischemic event. And of course, if you were older and you smoked and had diabetes and underlying cardiovascular disease or kidney disease, you were at greater risk of developing a cardiovascular event. And you know, this, I brought. I, I thought this was very interesting because you know we know that also COVID increases your risk of cardiovascular events, and now we're uh, you know reaching the influenza season where COVID meets influenza, and we have to be very careful to try to mitigate both of these infections because we may be seeing a higher rate of cardiovascular events in the patients who are admitted. Now this uh, paper was editor uh, had an editorial, and the um, person who wrote it brought up some very interesting points that, you know, the efficacy of influenza vaccines is about 15 to 45%, and that should be regarded as secondary prevention for cardiovascular diseases, uh, cardiovascular events. 
And it's more or less the same protection that taking statins or blood pressure medications or smoking cessation gives you, but it is better ingrained in our brains as medical providers, as well as patients, that we should take our statins and blood pressure meds. It's not as well ingrained that we should get the flu vaccine. So, you know, the, we, the editorial says we accept the importance of all these other measures, but it seems that the importance of flu vaccination is not a, 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 on top of our priority list. So it is a time to recognize that, especially in this season that we're coming into, we have to maximize our flu vaccination. And, every, and unless you have a, con, a medical contraindication to the vaccine, everyone should get a uh, flu vaccine. So now I'm going to switch gears to give you uh, some updates on treatment. So this slide that I had got from Clinical Care Options, uh, it's a very nice slide because it uh, graphs the, the severity of the illness based on the time course of the illness. So in the first week, basically you're having viral replication and your body's responding to that viral replication and the patient may have a little bit of fever, a dry cough, laboratory-wise, maybe lymphopenia, or otherwise no major disasters. But when you're hitting day eight or nine, <coughs> excuse me, day eight or nine, then is when your immune response starts building up, and not in everybody, but in a minority of patients, maybe 10, 15%, that immune response is not well controlled, and you hit the, what's called the host inflammatory response phase, this is where patients develop ARDS, shock, et cetera. So the treatments that we have available today are remdesivir, which is an antiviral, uh, and has been proven to be effective in reducing the duration of symptoms and decreasing hospitalization. Mortality is still a little bit iffy uh, at the in this phase of the disease, the secondary phase between the viral and the full inflammatory response. Dexamethasone, we know, decreases mortality in this phase. And of course, oxygen also decreases mortality. Now we have to add here convalescent plasma because this was introduced uh, recently, not the convalescent plasma, but the EUA authorization for using it. Uh, and it, the, data, the final word is still not out there. We're still waiting for randomized controlled trials, but uh, there is some indirect evidence that it may be helpful. So the Infectious Disease Society of America, if you look at their guidelines, they only suggest using remdesivir and steroids in hospitalized patients with severe uh, COVID-19. Um, now here, convalescent plasma is still on the clinical trial, but this slide is old. And you know, in the COVID era, old is three days old. Uh, so we'll update it for clinical, I'll, I'll contribute my share to clinical uh, options and I will put convalescent plasma here because that's what's probably going to be on the next slide review. So this just shows the, the number of clinical trials uh, for COVID-19 that are, uh, have been done or are ongoing since the pandemic started by countries. You can see that at the beginning it was basically China doing all the clinical trials because they were the only ones hit by it. But as the pandemic started spreading out, we're here on March 16, I mean, it's four months from now, but you can see a, a more distribution of the countries that are involved, involved in clinical research to try to find a treatment for this disease. And uh, interestingly, Iran is there, and uh, I will show you one or two studies that came from Iran. Um, okay. okay, so is there anything new on remdesivir? So remdesivir, there's a new study. The objective was to evaluate five days versus 10 days versus placebo, or placebo on patients with standard of care treatment, um, and to see how these patients were doing on day 11 of their treatment. Um, and the, they, they randomized them on a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio, um, and the main outcomes were um, clinical status on day 11, and also, they also looked at other dates that I'll show you, but that was the main point of the, of the study. So I'll walk you through this graph, which seems a little bit complicated, but on all these remdesivir studies, they've used a seven grade scale. The best one is the light blue, it means you're discharged from the hospital. The worst one is the dark, which is you're dead. And then the, in between you have all these little gradients. So 
for all purposes, just look at the light blue and the dark scale on each graph. So this is day 11, and these are patients that receive standard of care, or five days of remdesivir, or 10 days of remdesivir. And what they found is that um, five days seems to be better than a standard of care. You see a, a, a higher, not higher, but bigger light blue uh, part of the graph and very low mortality. But when they did 10 days, uh, it didn't seem to be a difference. Actually, it looks a little bit worse, which I don't understand why, except maybe it's just the number of patients and the statistics are, you need a bit more number. But when you look at, the, at day 28, it seems a little bit more reasonable. Uh, standard of care, uh, it's this one, five days. There's more patients being discharged when they got five days of remdesivir and the mortality is lower. But when you get to day 10, there's really not a big difference from day five to 10. So their conclusion was the remdesivir for five days in patients with um, admitted with uh, moderate COVID-19 is better than standard of care, but it's not better to prolong treatment for five more days. Uh, and the clinical impact of this is difficult to ascertain at this point. But I think this was a one novel thing because we are using this drug. One thing that I found very interesting is what I'm showing you right now. So some researchers in Germany at the Max Planck Institute found that there's a, 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 a viral enzyme called papain-like protease, protease or PL-PRO. I'll use PL-PRO, it's easier to pronounce. And this enzyme is important in the replication of the coronavirus, of the COVID-19. And also it blunts the immune response. It decreases the interferon levels that are being produced in the cell um, during the infection. So they thought if there could be a drug that could block this enzyme, we would have a double whammy because on one side it will decrease viral replication and on the other side it will let the immune response be better. So another group of people through some computer generated algorithm started looking at molecules that could block that enzyme. Now, molecules of drugs that we already have. And what they found is that famotidine, which is an H2 blocker, is an anti-acid, very commonly used, has an, uh, was the best, one of the best drugs they found that would block this enzyme, hypothetically. And uh, what they did is, um, and, and, and also, you know, it's a drug that we, it's licensed, it's safe. We have a lot of experience with it, using it as an anti-acid. So if this, one would, would, if this drug would work, it would be great. And then there's a retrospective observational study that looked at patients with COVID-19 using this drug, which showed some favorable, favorable results. So what this has triggered is randomized study comparing famotidine to placebo, which is ongoing. And if everybody's interested in the details, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. And this is the number, the identifier of that study. So, I am hopeful that if they found any effectiveness, effectiveness on this drug, it would be very interesting. So the, the observational study, which is a pretty good study, but it's not randomized uh, control study, they looked at patients that were admitted with COVID-19, they looked uh, in the hospital, and they looked how many of these are receiving famotidine. And they, um, it was 9.5%. So they compared that group to the ones who were not receiving it, what they found is that the ones that were on famotidine had less mortality than the ones who were not on famotidine. Uh, now, the groups, this was not a randomized control study, so they looked at the demographics and the non-famotidine groups seemed to be a little bit older. So they did a uh, propensity match uh, study to see if the age was the factor that you were surviving because you were younger and not because you actually were on famotidine. And uh, the results did not change according to these authors. Uh, also, they noticed the inflammatory markers like ferritin or CRP, D-dimer, et cetera, were lower in the famotidine group. So I think it's pretty interesting data. We, we still have to wait until we get the, the results from that randomized control trial and see if this is a, a drug that will be useful. Um, Okay, this is a slide that just shows the summary of all the drugs, not all of them, but of many of the drugs that have been tested for COVID-19. Majority of the trials have been negative. The only one that still uh, has some future is in interferon beta 1b. It's, I believe they did it inhaled in the study. They compared it to, their baseline treatment was lopinavir-ritonavir because in those countries, 
this was the standard of care, and they added the inhaled uh, interferon and ribavirin, and it seemed to have at least a virological impact. And now there's a randomized study looking at clinical impacts. The two uh, cytokine storm blockers, uh, tocilizumab and cerilumab, uh, they show some promise, but the final results are still not out there and they should only be used in a, a research situation or clinical trial situation. Then the other very interesting one comes from Iran. So uh, in Iran, sofosbuvir and diclatosvir, which are two drugs that we used to use for hepatitis C, we still use uh, sofosbuvir. Diclatosvir, we don't use it anymore because we have some other better combinations. But these are two great hep, hep C drugs and they found that they have in vitro activity into, against COVID-19 and at, at a concentration that is obtainable when you give these medications to a human being. So in Iran, the standard of care is lopinavir, ritonavir, which by the way, we don't have any evidence that it works, but that's their standard of care. So they added softoclatosvir, small study, but well done, open label, randomized, controlled, 33 patients on the softoclatosvir group, and 33 on the non-soft group. And what they found is some interesting results that uh, there was a clinical recovery within 14 days, a little bit better when you're on the soft platosphere, and some other clinical parameters that look um, important, I mean, favorable. But statistically, not really significant on mortality, but the problem was that the number of patients was very small. So when you look at the mortality, they looked at, I'm sorry, time to clinical recovery, the control group did better, did worse than the soft declarative group, uh, but still the study is very small and they couldn't make big conclusions. So what they did, they did two other studies in Iran uh, in parallel using soft declarative with other baseline drugs. Uh, but when uh, you looked at the clinical recovery of all these studies, they favored the, the patients that were receiving the soft declarative Now. Um, they, when they looked at survival, same deal. If you're taking soft the, the cladosphere on any of these three studies, your mortality was lower. Basically, the Iranian researchers were very cautious and responsible, and they said, all this tells us is that there may be something with this combination of drugs. Now we need to do a serious study to really find out if it, it works or not. So they, there's, a, there's a discovered uh, clinical trial in Iran. They're enrolling 600 patients, double-blind, placebo-controlled, comparing uh, soft declatosphere with lopinavir ritonavir versus lopinavir ritonavir by itself and monitor severe COVID-19. It's going to end this month, I mean, next month. So hopefully we'll have some results. And if this pans out, another uh, potential treatment tools in our armamentarium. Now, I have to say that Iranians were able to do this because all these drugs are very cheap there. Here, they're extremely expensive, uh, but I think that's something that we'll have to deal with if these drugs work. So finally, for those who are uh, disenchanted with medicine and want to do something else related to it, you can go into the 3D printer business of nasopharyngeal swabs. I found this a small study very interesting um, and basically these individuals or researchers did, uh, they fabricated um, swabs with a 3D printer uh, and the swab was polyester tip swabs, a little bit different than what's being uh, used, that we are using right now. But when they compared it to our traditional swabs, uh, the, the swabs that they made was a little bit more sensitive for COVID-19, 91% versus 81%. So, this is a photograph of the CD, 3D printer producing the swabs. And then their study that they found that they were safe, they were easily made, they were durable, and they were very cheap, five cents per swab. So if you wanna go into that business, I think this is the right time to make, put your money on that pot. And I'll stop there. And I'm open to any questions if there are any. We don't have any questions in the chat, but if anybody has any questions, they can ask them now. Thank you for a great presentation, Dr. Mara. You're welcome. The survey 
link is in the uh, chat box if you will fill that out. Um, hearing no questions, we can go ahead and conclude today's session. Thank you everyone and we'll see you next week.